Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is Conservation in the Classroom, where you get a chance to interact with one of WWF's very own experts or scientists here. My name is Kate. I will be your host for today's event. And before we get started and I introduce our awesome presenter that we have today, I want to take a few minutes just to give a huge shout out to those classes that we have joining us on camera. For those of you that are watching live off camera, if you can introduce yourself in the chat box that you see on your screen there, and we'll be sure to give you guys a shout out as well. So when you hear your name called, students, now is your chance to wave your hands, be loud, let, let Ryan know that, we're, that you're there, okay? So first up, we have Miss Mayer's class from Jefferson Middle School in San Gabriel, California. <laughs> that was great. Okay, we also have Miss Estrada's class from Hamilton Middle School in Phoenix, Arizona joining us. Awesome. And finally, from La Belle, Florida, we have students Serena and Regina. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I know you, you girls have to make up the noise for <laughs> to compete with the other classes there. Um, we, it looks like we do have some classes that are watching live. So like I said, if you guys want to introduce yourself, um, we can give you a shout out. Um, let's see, we have Miss is, let's see, Beret's fifth grade class um, from Orlando, Florida. Thanks for joining us. Um, we might have another one here. The Tea and Aquariums joining us also. And Alden and Cameron from New Mexico. What's up, everyone? Thanks so much for joining us. Um, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is to hear from our presenter, Ryan Young, who is a program officer of sustainability research and development here at WWF. Ryan actually uses geography to make connections between people, places, and things. And today he's gonna talk to us a bit about how we can use maps to learn more about our environment and ways to help it, while also giving us a glimpse at exactly what it means to be a geographer in this day and age. So without further ado, uh, Ryan, thanks so much for joining us. You can take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching this and, and letting me be a part of this. Uh, thumbs up if everybody's doing okay and can hear me. Yeah, okay, I see a lot of that stuff. Great, I'm gonna share a presentation that I have for you all. Give me one moment. Okay, is it up and running? Thumbs up, everybody can see my presentation. Wonderful. Again, thank you so much for being here. Again, my name is Ryan Young. I work with the World Wildlife Fund. I specifically uh, am a geographer, but I do a whole lot of other things um, for the team. I work um, on a team that engages with the private sector. So we work with companies uh, to talk to them about sustainability and conservation and what it means to be a sustainable company in this day and age. Uh, and, and even more specifically, I work on a team uh, called Sustainability Research and Development which again is learning about the science and translating the science that we get from academia and other researchers so that we can uh, talk to companies about what that means. So uh, just a little back, bit of background on myself um, before we dig into geography. Uh, again, my name is Ryan. I am from Austin, Texas. Uh, when I was in uh, middle school and high school, I had some really good teachers that were teaching me about marine science and aquatic science and environmental science. And I got really excited uh, about learning about these things, about how the world worked and, and my surroundings and my environment. Um, and from there, uh, when I was going to college and thinking about college, I knew that I wanted to, I think, study sciences and, and marine sciences. So I tried my hand in a, in a couple of different fields, um, but I ended up at Texas Tech University, where you can actually see that little soccer player out there. That's in uh, the panhandle of Texas at a place called Lubbock, Texas, where the wind blows very strong and there's a lot of tumbleweeds and a lot of agriculture. And I got an, an undergraduate degree in natural resource management. So we were looking at uh, what it means to 
uh, have water and who does the water go to, to the farmers and to the people who use it. And as I was studying environmental science and things like this, um, I realized that geography was being used as a tool um, to study these things and, and to tell the stories about what we were finding. And so uh, as I got a little bit older and, and kept working uh, in the environmental field, I realized that geography was something I wanted to study a little bit more in depthly. So I, I found out that there was this software, there was this tool uh, that we call GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And I had found out that there was a science um, tied behind all of this. So I ended up studying for a master's degree at the University of Denver for Geographic Information Sciences. So uh, that's my kind of schooling, but outside of school, I love to play soccer. I've been playing since I was about four years old. I still, as you can see uh, in the right corner there, I have a little team that I've uh, coached for a while. I still play very competitively. And I also love to be outdoors. I love to camp. I love to go see nature and its natural environments. Uh, I love to hike and do all those types of things. And that's my little dog up there in the right corner. That's Lola. Um, and then from, um, from my master's degree, I lived in Eastern Tennessee near the Smoky Mountains for a little while where some of my family lives now. And then I eventually ended up here in Washington, DC where I've uh, spent the last two and a half years working with the World Wildlife Fund. And I also did a, a little bit of time um, working with NASA. Um, since I've been in DC, I've learned a lot about uh, non-governmental organizations and, and the government and science. And it's really been an, an eye-opening experience for me. And I've, I've even learned more about what it means to be a geographer and how we apply its concepts to uh, natural resource management and, and conservation and, and earth sciences. So uh, since I can kind of see you all, I'm sure that you have had courses in geography before. Yes, raise your hand if you've looked at maps in, in your studies before. That should be everybody. I hope everybody, yes. All those who are paying attention. So what is geography? So very fundamentally, geography is a Greek word for earth description. And so with that, we are looking at things on the earth, like we are studying the earth's features. So we wanna look at the mountains and the water and the grasslands and the forests. And we wanna look at human activity uh, we're looking at transportation like cars and buses and trains and airplanes and ships. And we want to study about uh, human populations and animal populations. And what are our resources? Where do we grow food? How, how do, what are the patterns and trends between all of these things? And, and what does weather look like? What does pollution look like? So again, I study geography as a tool to study the earth and apply its concepts to conservation and sustainability. Uh, natural resource management, and of course, understanding how humans and the environment interact. So again, why geography? Well, of course, we're studying planetary health. We want nature and humans to live in harmony. We want to be able to understand uh, what our interactions look like. The environment's interactions to itself and humans' interactions to the environment and even human interactions to other humans. And we're, in, in the case of WWF, we are trying to problem solve and we want to story tell what we're finding because that's a really important piece of what we do. So as you can see here, some of these slides, you know, we're looking at pandas and elephants on these slides, but there's all sorts of uh, creatures out there that we, that are important to us and tell us things about our environment. So if we know that these animals and these species are healthy, then we hope and expect that our environment's healthy as well, which in turn uh, lets us believe and hope that humans are also healthy. And we're looking at things like agriculture. So how much food needs to be grown across the world for people uh, to not go hungry? And what does it mean to put um, chemical inputs on this um, land that we grow food? And where do those chemicals go? And also how much energy do we need um, we have things like dams for hydropower. Uh, we burn coal. We do all sorts of things, wind energy, and we have to move those across our landscapes so that um, people have electricity and power. So again, we're trying to solve real world problems and we're trying to anticipate problems that might arise in the future. Uh, and so there's a lot of tools and a lot of data now that we can use um, for uh, looking at these things and using geography.
So how do we use geography? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of kind of background information of how we use it, and then I'm going to talk to you about how I use it. So first, think about how you use maps in the real world. Think about how you learn the concepts using maps. Uh, think about what your neighborhood looks like. Uh, think about your school safety plans or how your parents or your bus driver or how you walk to school. You need maps. You need to understand your environment. You need to navigate. And think about how much easier it is to show someone what you're talking about. And so you can agree with what's on the, the features on the map. So we can talk about things like direction and size and shape and distance. Um, these things, some of these things may seem foreign to you, but I guarantee you already use them in your daily life. Um, so what we see here obviously is a map that you might find out on a trail, on a hike. Uh, and so you're looking at um, potentially what features are out there. You know, what does the landscape look like? What are the names of these places that I'm seeing on the map? Perhaps it's cloudy and I can't see any of these things. So somebody who made this map is showing me a representation of what's out there so that I can understand. So when we look at maps in a, in a more broad worldly concept, we want to come to agreements again about what features and land types are on the maps. So this is stuff that we care a lot about at WWF. We want to understand what biomes are in ecoregions, and we want to be able to translate that so we can communicate with other people around the world about what they are and, and how they work and how they function. So this is about understanding the world as, as themes and areas and, and what to expect in them and, and the relationships between them and, and planning um, when there are changes in them. So maps are used in places like museums to show what kind of animals live where in this case, per perhaps what these animals eat, what their habitat ranges are, and perhaps some indication of why they've changed or why their habitat um, has changed or their, or their food has changed or where humans are now interacting with them. And, and on the left there, you can, it's not necessarily a map, but a representation of perhaps what vegetation grows at different elevations, which is really important for understanding uh, if climate change is changing vegetation regimes or where we might expect animals to move or be in the future. So one of the project areas that I work on a lot is this agriculture sector. And agriculture has a huge influence on food security, economics, and people's livelihoods, and biodiversity, you know, people potentially destroying homes for animals. But we're also concerned with how much is happening. In this case, we're seeing uh, a slash and burn where somebody's coming into this landscape and, and setting it on fire, and they're clearing out this forest to make way uh, to grow ag some sort of agriculture. And this can be problematic. Um, because if this happens a lot, then obviously we're going to have some air pollution issues. We're going to be losing habitat uh, or, or what we call deforestation or land conversion. And this is happening in different parts of the world where, um, you know, people are, are seeing uh, options um, for land to do this on. And we at WWF want to try to kind of halt uh, this phenomenon. Um, so what we do is we look at where these things are happening and we start to use this information to, to put on a map to tell uh, a story. Again, looking at uh, kind of the last slide uh, onto this one, um, we can now use satellites for, uh, as an amazing resource for us. So here we're building again on the last image that we saw, and we can track how much deforestation is happen happening and how quickly we can see it occurring. So on the left there, you can see this place, I believe it's in Brazil, that is just getting deforested at a very high rate. And we can literally watch the satellites um, seeing this land deforested. And we can then assign numbers to how much this is happening. And on the right, uh, we see uh, the temperature, uh, global temperature that's rising uh, over the past, oh, I'm sorry, over the past um, 120 years or so. And we can start putting this kind of information on graphs so we can align these with maps to tell a story. 
again, something else I work on. Uh, this, this is agricultural focus, but this is actually um, more specific. This is dairy. So I worked with a yogurt company. And this is an example of how I used maps to com communicate with the yogurt company uh, concerned about where their dairy come from and what risks they might have environmentally from where they source from. And in particular, I was showing them what different water risks uh, were apparent in what, we, what their supply chain is, so where they source this milk from. Uh, and as you can see, I was looking at zip codes here in New York and Idaho and, as, and assigning risk from green low to yellow medium or red high. Unfortunately, we don't see any high on here. So that means the things are, are decent, but there could be potential to, to look out for. Again, we're using data to look at water quality and water quantity, occurrences of flooding, perhaps droughts. We can also use the company's data on where and how much um, they are sourcing and align that data with environmental data to make maps like this. And we use this to tell a story and for decision-making with the company for ourselves. So this helps them understand the risks and helps us make better decisions. So this is a slide of example of what I call going from no tech to high tech. So this is a quick example of how things either used to be done or done in some parts of the world um, where farmers and, and sellers are documenting their growing and, and buying and selling habits in handwritten form. But nowadays we love to digitize this information and make, it, make the information readable by computers so that we can then manipulate it on our end uh, and, and translate that to maps. So computers love data because we can make graphs, we can make maps, and we can make other images to show what's happening in our areas of interest. Again, this is another example of, of taking agricultural information and water basins in California. And we're looking at different risks. So again, we could look at things like what is the, uh, the impact of water on almonds or tomatoes, or perhaps how much pollution is happening in our cities across these water basins. So again, these are really powerful tools and examples of how we can overlay environmental information, company information, population information, and, and begin to understand uh, our world. This is kind of a gruesome photo, but something else that we, we like to look at and track is uh, human wildlife conflict. So um, in many cases, uh, humans and wildlife live in the same places, and this can cause serious problems for both parties. Here, a man lost his eye due to a run-in with a tiger. Of course, we know that People hunt tigers and, and kill them to keep them out of their neighborhoods and away from their families. But we also know that tigers sometimes uh, are looking for food and, and their areas aren't necessarily always well defined. So we use information and maps to attempt to understand where and how this issue is happening and how we can uh, perhaps plan for uh, better protected areas for tigers or better plan for communities so that these conflicts don't happen. Again, maps aren't the only solution, but they're a really powerful tool. This is one of my favorite slides and one of my favorite concepts that I don't work as much here at WWF on, but I, I just love it in the geographical sense, and that's weather, okay? This is, again, one of my favorite ones. So what we're looking at here is average sea surface temperatures. And this is really telling a story in a global context. So as we can expect, the equator is warmer at the poles, and, or sorry, <laughs> warmer at the equator, the, ugh, let me start over there. Sea surface temperature is warmer at the equator and colder at the poles. Uh, and if we look at this picture year after year, we might be able to start learning about what the patterns are because they're gonna look a little bit different year after year. And maps too are about art. Uh, these beautiful colors representing hot and cold. And you can study this, uh, this thing called cartography, which is really about the art and, and the beauty of representation and storytelling. Um, and uh, what you can do this, you know, by, by using colored pencils and things like that, but we can also use computers to represent these things. Because a lot of times we're taking in just massive amounts of data and we need to be able to manipulate that and tell a story. So there is this underlying kind of artful concept to all of this. Uh, here is some moving uh, GIFs of uh, tides. 
So geographers use this type of representation too to show what future scenarios might look like or what happens if perhaps we build a bridge or a dam or marina for boats and recreation. And we can study the tides from the ground. We can study the tides from the water, from the air and, and space using satellites. And we can understand how these tides are changing over time. You know, if, if global um, uh, ice caps are melting, or might we expect uh, the tide to rise in, uh, more in some places rather than others? And we can use these kind of computer simulated models to understand what might happen to these places in the future if tides do rise. This is a, a picture of the Arctic here. This is another project that I'm working uh, very closely on. And this is the future of the Arctic and the Bering Sea. So we know that a lot of sea life thrives in this area. And we know that a lot of indigenous or local communities rely on the ocean for food and sustenance and for cultural and traditional values. Well, the Arctic is changing. Sea ice is breaking up and changing its behavior. Sea life will change, of course. Ships will want to use new passages where sea ice isn't anymore. Fishers may want to move into these areas that weren't open beforehand. And we can start to lay out maps where all of these resources are and where they were and how they might change again so we can plan for the future and tell a story about what it looks like now and what it looks like in the future. And I share maps back and forth with my colleagues uh, who live in Alaska and Russia. And this is a really neat way to share information without having to you know, um, mail a paper map back and forth. But again, we do it over email, we do it over uh, cloud storage, and we can create the maps and share them back and forth and they can add uh, their components and I can add mine. Again, uh, this is gonna look at shipping. This, this slide looks at shipping. So this is a little bit of a continuation from the last slide, but this is another area in South America, but we're looking at a digital map now that shows us where ships are located. Um, perhaps we have data that is fed to us live um, so we can look at how they're moving, these ships are moving and what they're doing. And this is a great example of a digital map in motion. I know it's not in motion, but I promise you it, it is in real life. And we can, again, continuously feed data to it and change the features on the map as they're happening in, in real life and in real time. Something else that I do is I look at what's called ecosystem services. So what does the environment give to us? Um, and, and what are the services that nature provides to people? So here we have an example of trees perhaps getting cut down to make agriculture land. And when it rains and you have runoff, you perhaps might have more sediment running off into these streams. Well, that's gonna be costly for people downstream who need this water to drink and to uh, grow agriculture and, and these types of things. So we wanna be able to track over years how this, uh, these ecosystems are changing and how these services, uh, nature services for people are changing. And so I looked at a place in, um, in Brazil in the Atlantic forest to understand where services were lost from gain. And if the services were lost, where's their opportunity to per perhaps restore land to make it better for people and animals and how much might it cost and, and how much might it benefit people? Again, I want to reiterate that we went from paper maps to digital maps nowadays. And sometimes we still send people out into the field with paper maps. And sometimes they have very little detail and sometimes they have very high detail. And there's, a, there's just kind of a trick to, to knowing what to put on a map so that it's useful for somebody in the field. But a lot of times nowadays we're creating those maps uh, on a computer at the office and sending people into the field with them. So they have a little bit more information and context. Again, geography nowadays is about taking all this data that we have in the world, almost too much data that we have in the world and trying to distill it and, and use it for what we need, the purposes we need it for, for environmental conservation. Just to show you an example, this is NASA's uh, constellation of satellites and all these different satellites look at all these different features on the earth. Sometimes they're grabbing a picture. Sometimes they're telling us what the elevation is on the ground, what the clouds look like, what the weather's doing, uh, what is the soil moisture look like. 
and, and so this is a field that, that is um, really growing very quickly um, because we're understanding more about science and technology and we're trying to figure out how we can combine all this data to study the earth. So again, we like to, this is kind of what my day-to-day -day, uh, looks like when I'm working with maps. I take data and I put it into a software and I start creating maps and manipulating data and representing it uh, digitally. And as you know, smartphones have a bunch of capability and technology already built into them. And sometimes I'm pushing these maps to my colleagues' phones so that they have uh, this resource uh, and they can also sometimes um, click buttons and tell me what's in their landscapes and it gets fed back to me. Uh, here's an area of some folks that are talking about what we call marine protected areas. And they, they're looking and trying to plan about what, their, uh, what fishing looks like for their island and where that might be the places where they shouldn't fish in certain points of the season or what coral reefs could be protected. And this is uh, another example of what it might look to, to plan what a landscape looks like. So you, you want to be able to look at what different zones uh, activities should be. So where should I have housing? Where should I have agriculture? Where should I maintain forests or land for tigers? And finally, what did I study in school and what I think I would encourage you all to study in school? Clearly geography, I love geography environmental science, math, computer sciences. You can't go, really go wrong. Geography is, is such a powerful tool that you can use for, for virtually anything. Um, and so these are a couple of things that I would suggest that you look into and think about what you're interested in and, and try, to, try to think if uh, what you're interested in can be placed on a map. And then you can really kind of build up from there the concepts of what geography is and how powerful it is for you. And that's all that I have on my presentation. Thank you so much, Ryan. I think we all learned a lot about geography and how it can be used to help protect habitats around the world. So that was awesome. Students, this is your time to start getting those questions for Ryan ready. We are going to start the question and answer portion of the event now. For those of you that are watching off camera, um, that goes to you as well. If you have questions for Ryan, please submit them in the chat so that we can make sure to weave those in as we go through here. So we are going to start with Ms. Mayer's class from, from California. Just as a reminder, when you come up to ask your question for Ryan students, make sure you say your question nice and loudly and clearly for us. So Ms. Mayer's class, if you guys are ready, you're up first. If you could choose a, a country to restore, which country would it be and why? If I could choose a country to restore. Um, well, I think that can be broken out in a lot of different ways. Um, but I would have to say that I would want to start where I live. Uh, I have the most influence where I live. Um, of course, we work with projects all around the world. And we know that some areas are more sensitive to others. Um, but if I had the power and, and the power is only coming from me, I would start right here where I am. That's a great question to kick it off here. Uh, moving on to Miss Estrada's class in Arizona, if you guys are ready for your first question for Ryan. Come right here. What is one of the areas you mostly work on? Oh gosh. Um, I would say we spend a lot of time uh, in Brazil because again, um, as I mentioned, I work on a team that works with um, companies and a lot of companies uh, use a lot of natural resources that are um, sourced from Brazil. So things like uh, soy and cattle and um, pulp and paper for tissue and, and the paper that you write on. So um, Brazil is one of the places that we work in the most. Okay, Serena and Regina in Florida, you guys are up next. Okay. What's your biggest challenge with this technology? With the biggest one? 
Uh, we have a lot of challenges and that's kind of the beauty of this. Um, I would say one of the biggest challenges is that there is so much data out there that we get and it comes in so many different forms and we have to figure out a way to uh, take the data that's out there and, and manipulate it and, and massage it to a place that we need it so that we know how to use it and how to apply it to the things that we're looking at. Okay, we're going to go ahead and ask a question that got submitted in the chat, if that's okay with you, Ryan. Um, we have a group of fifth graders from Orlando that want to know, after you go to college, where would you apply to get into your type of profession? And if you have um, some suggestions of some good colleges to study geography. Oh, yes. A uh, very loaded question there. Um, so as I mentioned, geography is a tool that can be used in all sorts of fields of study. So I, of course, study environmental sciences, but you can look at uh, urban planning, um, again, environmental sciences. So where would you start? The, the rest of the question was, where would I start applying or looking to apply? Yes. Mm -hmm. right? um, well, there's some really great programs um, at NASA that I did called the DEVELOP program that was amazing to, to learn and apply remote sensing or satellite-based data. Um, and you can even be in high school and apply for this program. And, and it's really tailored for anybody that wants to learn how to use this type of data. Um, and the types of schools, um, gosh, there are so many schools with geography. Uh, the University of California schools uh, are great for that. Uh, but you can't really go wrong in, in most of these places. Again, I went to Texas Tech University and University of, of Denver, uh, and these were wonderful schools for geography. <laughs> okay, great. Um, let's go back to our classes that we have on camera. We'll do another round with them. So back to Ms. Mayer's class, if you guys are ready for your second question. What is the most neural what yeah, is the yeah. most notable thing that has changed in your career? Ooh, for, for me or, or for the, the sector? Uh, you're muted, say it again. For you. For me, for me. Um, so my last slide, I was um, showing you what I studied in college and, and what I think is important to study. And, and for me, um, this was really cool, but I played video games as a kid and I found out that, yeah, I know, I know, represent. Um, so um, I, I realized that geography, um, there was geography software on the computer. And to me, it was really cool to be able to apply the concepts that I was learning um, to geography using this tool and learning the tool for me was like playing video games. And I thought it was awesome. Um, so one of the biggest things that changed for me was learning um, computer science. So I had to learn how to code so that I could manipulate all this data that's coming in. So that's, that's one of the areas that when I, when I uh, got a job at WWF and worked some other places that I had to go and, and teach myself a little bit. Um, so that was probably one of the biggest things is learning computer science. I love that video games represent <laughs> um, okay, Ms. Estrada's class, if you guys are ready for your next question for Ryan. What's the best thing you discovered? In my life or in geography? <laughs> in geography. Geography. Wait, can I also ask? Um, so one of the, uh, the greatest things that I've um, discovered in geography uh, is what we call modeling. And modeling is, is really about understanding the systems of the earth. So if I have, let's say for instance, tree loss in Brazil, what does that mean for Brazil? What does that mean for the rest of the world? What does that mean for things that we look at like carbon sequestration or animal habitat or, or water resources, the quantity and quality of water? So modeling I think is one of the coolest things that I discovered. And, and that goes kind of into the computer science realm as well. I have to learn how to use math and, and data and science and, and computers to run these types of models. Okay, uh, Serena and Regina. What are some future projects you have in mind? Ooh, 
I got I'm trying to save the world. Um, so <laughs> there could be lots of projects. Um, so the, the one I explained about the, the Arctic um, is one of these new projects that I'm really excited about. Um, of course, the, the biggest thing with, with the World Wildlife Fund and, and conservation and sustainability in general is that we know that our world is changing and we know that there are places on the earth that are more sensitive than others. So, um, and it also depends on what we're looking at. So for instance, um, palm oil is in a lot of, of the products that we use day to day. And, and that's being uh, grown in a lot of uh, different areas of the world. And, and we're just on the somewhat on the forefront of, of learning about um, why it's grown there and, and what the, the purpose is of the land uh, and learning how to mitigate or, or stop deforestation. Um, and there are a lot of projects that are going on in this, but it's going to be something that um, we continue to work on because the world is changing and, and there are more people and we need to use more natural resources and we need to learn how to be more efficient using natural resources. Okay, uh, circling back into the chat questions. Um, we had a question submitted by Liv at TN Aquariums wants to know how can you use geography for animal conservation? Oh yeah, um, wow, it's in so many ways. Um, so imagine this, imagine uh, since you guys are out at an aquarium, imagine going out on a boat and counting the amount of times that you saw dolphins or whales or sea lions or certain types of fish. Well, over time, um, as you take these measurements, you're, you're taking a, a notation of what the animal is and where it is. And so over time, you can, you can start creating this picture of whether the, the species is in the same place or perhaps you know that the water chemistry is changing or perhaps something else is happening on land and the and these species ranges are starting to move. Uh, and so geography is a, is a wonderful way to study um, species. Okay, um, the same viewer would also like to know, Ryan, how does geography help reduce negative effects and impacts on the world and what can we do to help as well? Yeah, um, so a lot of geography, or at least the way we use it, is about um, reducing the, the negative effects. And, and as I mentioned in my presentation, it's really about storytelling. So we get all this data and, and we crunch it and we, and we get into this format where we can put it onto a map. And then we can share that with the people we want to engage with. And sometimes the people we engage with are, are companies. Sometimes it's um, other people that work for WWF. Sometimes it's people who live in, in different areas across the world. Um, and so as we use geography for storytelling, we are really trying to get on the same page of what the world looks like. Um, and so that's one of the best ways to come to a common understanding uh, about how the world works. There was another question that nested in there. Uh, let me see. What, what, what can they do to help? Yeah. Oh my gosh, go study geography. Go study environmental sciences and computer programming. Uh, go understand how agriculture works. Go understand what um, species and humans need to live uh, together. Okay, we'll do a third round of questions from um, the, the people joining us on camera. So we'll go back up to Ms. Mayer's class, if you guys are ready. What was the greatest impact you've seen during your whole career? The greatest impact that I've seen in my whole career. You guys have tough questions. I love it. Um, what is the greatest impact that I've seen in my entire career? Well, um, again, as I mentioned that computer science was a, a, a huge component of, of my learning and geography. Um, I think one of the greatest impacts is uh, data and the amount of data and where we get data from. Because as I mentioned, um, data can come from satellites. It can come from uh, people. Um, it can come from even uh, folks going out into the environment and, and listening to what's in nature. And that's a really powerful thing. And, and so the most impactful thing is learning how all of this data interacts and talks to each other and what it actually means. Okay, cool. Um, Miss Estrada's class in Arizona, you guys are up next. 
How long have you been working with with G, 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 geography? geography? Sorry, the question was how how long I've been working in, with geography. No. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I started. Well, let's say this. I'm going to give you some even um, bigger perspective. I started learning about geography and maps back when they were all on paper when I was younger than you all. I used to sit in a car um, with my family and we would drive from Texas to Colorado. And I would have to figure out what the pathway was um, to get maybe to the next food stop or the next bathroom stop. Of course, so uh, that's when I learned how to use maps and what they were used for. And then I ended up in, um, I was traveling in London and, I, and I've traveled to Tokyo, Japan where there's these massive uh, subway systems and we had to navigate from one end of the city to the other. And that took maps to, to figure out how to do. So I have, I've really been um, studying, uh, not always formally, but I've been studying geography from a very young age. Of course, then in, in college and high school, uh, and even beyond college, I continue studying geography. So um, if you want me to tell you how old I am, I'm 32 years old, and I probably started studying maps when I was about four years old. Back in the, the age of strictly paper maps, right? That's correct. All right, Serena and Regina. How do you think you, we can reach more people with this information? Whew. Um, technology makes it really good for that. So you can go on to WWF websites, you can go to NASA websites, you can go to millions of websites, Uber, and Lyft, and, and Zillow, and all sorts of places have maps nowadays. Um, so we are in this age where maps can be made digitally and they can be shared back and forth. So that's the best way to get any sort of information out, perhaps. Um, in terms of information that WWF get, uh, gets and, and, and translates and disseminates to the public, um, how do we do that? I mean, we, we talk with people that are in the landscapes that we work in, and we talk with people that are important stakeholders and who makes decisions. And so that's really, I think, the best way to get this information out there. Okay, another question in the chat we have here from Kim Burrow. Uh, wants to know, can you think of times when mistakes in map making caused unintentional problems? Yes, yes, yes. There, there actually is a book, uh, I'm forgetting the exact title, but I believe it's called um, How to Lie with Maps. So again, maps are storytelling um, tools. So there are times when people manipulate the data or they suggest things on a map that aren't necessarily there or, or they're telling a, a, the story that they want to tell, which is not a true representation of what's happening. And so there's lots of examples of uh, people manipulating uh, maps in their favor. Um, Okay, we are almost at that point um, of time here. So we're gonna take one more question that got submitted in the chat that we feel is a pretty good one to wrap up with here from our Orlando fifth graders wanna know, what is the most challenging part of your job? Um, the world is changing and that is the most uh, difficult, challenging part of my job. And, and keeping up with how the world is changing is a very difficult thing to do because it takes a lot of time to, to study the effects of earth processes and, and people and populations. Um, and, and so we're, we're trying to move into this uh, realm where, where we are getting the data in real time and understanding the situation as it is and trying to predict the future with, with modeling if it's climate or population or whatever the case may be. Um, but that's the biggest challenge is that it's always moving. It always will be changing, uh, but we're trying to create the, the best uh, example of what a sustainable uh, future is. What a great question and a perfect answer to end on. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> so unfortunately, we are out of time today. Uh, students and teachers, if you still have questions for Ryan that we didn't get to, you can email them to wildclassroom at wwfus.org, and we will be sure to pass those along to Ryan and get some answers sent back to you. I want to give Ryan a huge thanks for presenting for us today and all of us that joined on camera and off. Um, thank you all for joining us as well. We're going to unmute everyone's microphone now so everyone can have the chance to thank you properly. Ryan, thanks again. Thank you all for the wonderful questions and thank you for listening. Take care. Thank you. Hope to see you all in the future. <laughs>